Acts chapter 15 as we're going along here in the book of Acts. It is a pleasure to have our children in the sanctuary this morning and hopefully uh, you guys are able to worship and, um, and to praise the Lord this morning during our time of praise and worship. It, you know, I, even for you guys, I think it's, it's something you have to really work at and you have to fight to, to focus your mind and your heart on why we're here, what's the purpose for why we're here. We're here to set our eyes and our hearts, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That is why we're here. And one of the things that you guys can develop, even, even as children, is to worship. And sometimes that means you have to fight your selfish desires, close your eyes, and, um, and think about, and one of the things that helps me in worship as I come in this morning, because I don't like the fact that I have to walk up here and stand in front of people and talk. Could you imagine that? Once a week. You got to walk up here and I, oh man, I don't want to do it. But as I think about all of the good things that he has done for me throughout the week and how I have run to the Father and cried out to him, it allows me to say, you know what, this is, the, this is what God is going to be in the future as well too. So we have to take our time of worship and really do that and work on worship. And it's, it's something that you will find will be a blessing for you as well. But kids, I'm really happy to have you guys here. And um, this past Wednesday, I was sharing with our men's group the opportunities that I've been having. And it's something that God is doing. And I understand the whole thing that he's doing, but he's bringing people to my door. We happen to live in a brand new community. And because of that, oh my goodness, we had people coming to the door for everything. Apparently our front yard needs to be sprayed, uh, but that's, you, you spray, now you spray the front yard for insects. Did you know that? Okay, I'm new to the party. All right, it's not just for weeds, but that keeps them from coming into the house. So I'm like, okay, so I'm being educated. And it's, it's just a mirror. This past week, I set it up. We have can, so here it is. Canvassers come out and they knock on the door, right? The canvassers set up the salesmen. The salesmen don't come to your door anymore. It's canvassers. So don't ask the canvasser what kind of, you know, product they have. They said, well, we'll have to bring out the salesman. So this past week, I set up for uh, a water filtration expert to come in and share with me what I needed. Yes, and we spent an hour and a half together. I began by saying, would you like a cup of coffee? He was a guy from England. Oh, he was so much fun to listen to, but he hated life after he found out I was not going to buy his $7,000 product. And, uh, I, oh my goodness, the attitude and everything. Went, well, you know, my problem was that he didn't buy my product either because I was sharing Jesus Christ. He began by talking to me about the universal solvent. Do you know what the universal solvent is? You can ask Alexa or, or hey Google, and she will tell you that the universal solvent is supposed to be water. And what I found out is that this word, this definition for solvent here in the Greek, or not in the Greek, but in the Latin this morning means to untie and to loosen. Isn't that cool? A solvent unties and loosens the molecules and it's usually in a liquid form. So that's what he was, and, and as soon as he said, the universal solvent, I was like, no, it's not water. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the universal solvent. <laughs> what can make me whole again? So Kyle and Tiffany are working on this new song. Nothing but the universe. Oh, precious is the flow that makes it slightly dingy. Oh, no, it's the blood of Jesus Christ and it's the person of Jesus Christ who is our acting universal, untying and freeing. What were we singing about this morning? The freedom that we, over and over, did you notice the liberty theme, the, the freeing theme from Jesus Christ and what he does in our heart and in our life? That's what we're here to focus on. But yeah, he didn't buy what I was selling and I didn't buy what he was selling. But praise God, we you know, at least he got to hear of the universal solvent. He got to hear the gospel. But as soon as I shared with my guys on Wednesday night, who was it, TJ, and I think it was Kyle, they were like, oh, no, Dave, what did you buy now? <laughs> don't, Dave, don't, don't. Praise God for my wife who walked in and said, how much is it? I was like, uh, okay, whew, off the hook. But, I mean, he was packing up. Okay, yeah, whatever. Out the door, angry. 
angry, but maybe just pray for him. His name is Nick. He got to hear about the true universal solvent. But in light of that, I, I want you to think about, and this is a theme that continues to come up in Scripture. This is a theme that takes place because our hearts have a tendency to add something to Jesus. We think there is something else that is needed other than Jesus, and we as believers think that, and it comes up often in our life because of the way that we're raised. And uh, the fact of the matter is, it's just not true. And that's the theme that we're going to be looking at this morning. Um, chapter 15 and verse 1. This is the New Living Translation. Listen to what it says. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch, Syria. Remember, Antioch, Syria is the main church now. It is that multiracial, multicultural sh uh, church that has Greek, um, um, Gentile, and Hebrew leadership in it. And uh, some men, this is what happened. Some men from Judea, that's, a, that's code for Jerusalem, arrived and began to teach the believers. Now, these were believers teaching the believers. And listen to what they taught them. Unless you are circumcised, as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Do you understand what they were teaching? You cannot be saved unless you follow the law of Moses and be circumcised. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. And finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by local believers to talk to the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way, on their way south, to Jerusalem. Uh, they stopped in Phoenicia as well as Samaria to visit with the believers. And there they told them, uh, to, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. They were being changed. They were being transformed. This was incredible. It goes on to say this, when they arrived, this is Barnabas and Saul, when they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and the elders. They reported everything that they had done for God. Is that what it says? Look at it. They reported everything that they had done for God. Is that what it says? Well, what does it say? Everything God had done through them. It's important we understand. Last week we talked about predestination. We talked about God's choosing, God's foreknowing, and all of those different things. And here we see the way it unfolds in the narrative this morning. God does everything in and through us. It's not what we do for him. It's that we are his workmanship. This is going to come up later in the passage. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he does in and through us. Understand that? It's not what you do. And our tendency is to say Jesus plus what? Everything. Jesus plus. The church community, you know what the church is going to say to you? The church is going to say this. It's going to say it needs to be Jesus plus water baptism. Have you ever heard that? Uh, you need to be baptized in our church. If you, anybody ever spoke to you about that before, you're not really saved because you weren't baptized. And then within baptism, they have like their little argument there. Not only do you need to be immersed, that means all the way down, but then they're like, you know what, what do we do for people who are in the hospital who can't be immersed? All right, we as a church will allow them to be sprinkled because unless you are baptized, you can't be saved. No, that's what Paul and Barnabas were having such a problem with. All right, let's, let's keep going. I'm, I'm going to get uh, sidetracked because this, this message is, well, it, it, you know, it brings up emotions. Well, what is the beginning? It said arguing vehemently, but let's, let's move on just a second. And let's go down through verse 5. It says this, But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect, of the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. And here that goes back to verse 1. That means they cannot be, a, be saved apart from following the law of Moses as well as being circumcised. So that's where we find ourselves this morning. And, and like I said, there's, there's other things that people come alongside. And you guys do this too. You guys did this this week. Because why? Jesus wasn't enough for you this week. Something we always fight. In some area of your life, he wasn't enough for you. Do you know why I know that? Because you experienced fear. You know what fear is? Fear is looking at yourself, looking at your situation, and not bringing the omnipotent God into the situation. You allowed yourself to think that you're in this alone and fear came in and 
Well, what did you do? You lived your life for a moment in time, separated from Jesus, not believing his power is going to do it. We all do this. We all have a tendency to trust in ourselves or to add something to it. And like a lot of times you hear people say this, Jesus is good, Jesus is okay, but, right? But you need this. But you have to have this. But if you don't get this, and kids, let me ask you a question. Do you guys deal with this as well too? Do you remember in children's church about three weeks ago, one of the kids there had a problem with being afraid of the dark? Now kids, look around. Any of you adults, anybody here ever have a problem in your childhood of being afraid of the dark? Raise your hand. Look around. It's a common problem. Do you see everybody here just about had a problem with the dark? It's a big issue. One of the beautiful things is it was either me or one of the kids said, to the child who had a problem and opened up about this, they said, do you pray and ask Jesus for help when you're afraid? And you know what the child said? Nope. No, I do not. Mm -mm. Then we ended up praying for this child that this child would pray and ask Jesus to be a part of the problem in the situation. This is, hey, listen, as we talk about this with kids, it's the same heart that we have as well too that thinks that we can do and be and live apart from Jesus or that, you know, Jesus isn't quite enough. He's not enough. Do you guys experience that lately as adults in any way, shape, or form? Do you think about it? All right, this is, apparently this is confessional time because I have to confess this morning that I did it. I've been doing it for the next last two or three weeks. You know how I know I'm doing it? Because when I go to the mailbox, for some reason, our mailbox is about one mile away from our house. Right, Mike? Well, you know, Mike comes over to the house and he's like, hey, you got your mailbox right there in front of the house. I said, no, ours is packed by the entrance. Now, why did they do that? But every time I go, I notice. You guys do? Isn't that ridiculous? Like you have to do your duty and stop, I don't know. I don't know. I tried to get that fixed beforehand as well. But every time I go to the mailbox, I have this anticipation. I haven't received my stimulus. All right? So I go to the mailbox and I'm like, maybe it's today. Maybe it's today because I need glasses. These are like five years old and they're scratched up and they're falling off my face. And only the stimulus can save me. <laughs> it, what are you laughing about? No, I've set a budget and God's confirmed the budget and I got to have this much comfort cushion in my bank account and then I got to have and the stimulus is coming and we already purchased purchased backsplash so we're already in the hole so we have to replace that please Jesus let it be the stimulus today and it's not it's what it's ads Ugh. yeah ads to buy more stuff I, I got to get my stimulus first my st it, you know and then when I leave just the frustration I got to deal with my attitude that's how I know that it's not just Jesus in my life. You know what's creeping in? You need Jesus plus. Jesus is not enough. You need something else. And that's what's going on in the text. Okay, there's other things going on in the text I really don't want to talk about, but I have to. You know what that means when they say you have to be circumcised? You know what it really means? You have to become Jewish. Could you imagine if somebody got up in this pulpit and this, this happened on a, on a Sunday morning in church, not a special called meeting. Now we've had those 15 years old, 15 years ago in the church where people almost went to blows during business meetings, but you kept that private. Shh, don't talk about it, right? But this is on church Sunday morning. Can't you see it? Listen to the words. Verse two, arguing vehemently. No, this is what it means in other translations. No small dissension or dispute. Sharp dispute. Heated argument. So what I picture in my mind is people holding back other people and them getting pushed off, ready to go to blows because of this topic. And what's the topic? Jesus isn't enough. You have to become Jewish in order to get saved. What if I stood here in the pulpit and said, you have to be white in order to be saved? You'd be laughing. What? That's essentially what they are saying. What if I said this? You have to, you know what? You're not really saved. It's Jesus plus becoming a Republican. <laughs> Thank you for the laugh. But it's not funny. I ran into people who actually have that belief. You know what that's called? Christian nationalism. That's what it's called. 
Because this is Jewish nationalism. God came to us Jews. God came to us Republicans. Or God came to us Democrats. No, you, can, you can't be saved unless you're a Democrat and a Christian. You cannot. That's the essence of what circumcision means. It's called ethnocentricity. And what they were trying to do is another big word, and that's called uh, a syncretism. I'll get it right. Syncretism. And that's when you take Jesus and you add him to your life. And you add all these other things that really do the work. But Jesus is good. No, he's okay. That's what they're doing. That's what's taking place here. That's why the argument, that's why the disagreement and the anger and the frustration, ethnocentricity, I can say that word. I'm proud of myself. All right, big word. Well, okay, all of this mess is going on. In verse 6, the apostles and elders met together to resolve the issue. And at the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter, Peter stood up and addressed them as followers. Listen to what he said. Brothers, you all know that I chose God. Is that what it says? I'll make you guys work. Look at the screen. What does it say? Haley, what does it say? God chose me. God chose me. Remember what we were talking about last week? Where does salvation come from? All of this is intimated in here of where salvation comes from. God chose me from among some t- a time to preach the Gentile to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Verse 8. God knows people's hearts. Listen, listen to his description of salvation. And he confirmed. And he accepts the Gentiles. Who's doing the work? Is it the Gentiles? Is it, this, is, this is why I have a problem. I had um, a person come to church here. And I, you know, kind of talked to him. And discussed things with him. And basically he said, Dave, you're a Calvinist. Because you believe that God saves you. I'm like, okay, whatever that means. And he said, no, we decide. We have a decision. So it really sounds like it's Jesus plus your decision. That's what it sounds like to me. It's Jesus. And like your decision is something good that you do that earns merit with God. No, it doesn't. Listen to what it says here. He confirmed that he accepts Gentiles and by giving them the Holy Spirit. Who's doing the work here? It's God. Just as he did to us. Verse 9, verse 9, look at it. He made no distinction between us and them. And he cleansed their hearts through this thing called faith. Who's doing the work here in the text? Who's doing the work? Do you really believe it? Do you really? Oh, Landon, you're going to miss this one. This is a really good story. I'm going to tell. He didn't want to hear it. It's about Zion too. Zion, will you tell him later? Will you tell? Okay. Three times in Zion's life, I think Zion knows that God's alive for these three reasons. Three times in his life this has happened. He said, Dad, he told me twice, he said, I prayed, this one time we were in the apartment, I prayed that you would come back and knock on the bathroom door and say certain words. And you, that's exactly what happened. I prayed that that would happen and that's exactly what happened. Well, it happened again, and it was with me when he was praying for me to say something. Well, this past week, he tried the prayer again. Except this time he was at school. This time he prayed that his teacher would say, if you finished, Zion, I might get it wrong, if you finished your work, you have fun day Friday. Is that basically what she said? Is that what you prayed? If you finished all your work... Then you have fun day Friday. And what did you pray? Did you pray that? That she would say those exact words? And what did she do? Did she say it to the whole class? Or did she? She came over to your desk and said it to you. Exactly. That's God being alive in your life. That's how you know. I know that when I pray to him, he listens. Come on. That God's going to cause somebody else to say the exact words that you pray that they would pray. That they would say. God's alive. It's Jesus plus what? Nothing. That's what we fight in our life. That's, that's, That's what we fight. We fight doing it ourselves. Trying to handle it ourselves. 
And he goes on here. Look at verse 10. Peter says this. So why are you now testing God and challenging God by burdening the Gentiles with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? That's the law. We couldn't accomplish it. We couldn't do it. And those in charge actually weren't doing it themselves from what Jesus said. It was a yoke that they couldn't bear as well. Verse 11 says this. We believe that we are saved all the same way. It's not by becoming a race. It's not by becoming a political party plus Jesus. By the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus, period. We sang about it. We don't understand it. Undeserved grace. Verse 12. Everyone listened quietly. I like that. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders they had done through God. Oh no, that's not what it says. What does it say? God had done through them among the Gentiles. Over and over again. This is something God does. Why don't we let him do it? Why don't we allow him to do it? You know why, kids? You know why we don't do it? It's because we are trained a certain way to believe that we have to do things. It's, it's Jesus in me plus the good things that I do that's going to make mom and dad happy. If I clean my room, I will earn merit with mom and dad. So God's got to be the same way. You do that your whole life. By what you do, you earn merit with others. So God's got to be that way. That's not the way he is. The undeserved grace of God is apart from works. So, this week you're going to be tempted to do what? Jesus plus fill in the blank. Jesus plus whatever else. And it's usually whatever else before it's Jesus. Listen to it. All of a sudden James says this. Okay, when they had finished, James. Now this is James, the brother of Jesus, who was the pastor at Jerusalem at that particular time. He stood up and he said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to make from them a people for himself. Look at all the work God is doing. And this conversation uh, of Gentiles, excuse me, this conversion of Gentiles is, is exactly what the prophets predicted. And this is out of Amos as well as Isaiah. It says this in verse 16. Afterward, I will return and restore the, the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be my own. All right, verse 19. I guess we've got to deal with verse 19 because this seems to throw a monkey wrench in everything that I've just said up until this point. Look at verse 19. James says this, So my judgment is that we should not make it a trouble or difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. So salvation is apart from works. It's apart from doing the law. It's apart from circumcision. It's something that God does completely. And then you turn to God. It's what he is doing in your life. But instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eat, excuse me, abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. Now, it seems like to this point it's completely apart from works, and then all of a sudden he says there's all these requirements, maybe your translation says, of things that we need to do. For it says this, verse 21, for these laws of Moses have been preached in, uh, in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath, for many generations. Now, remember, the law was circumcision. It was ceremonial laws. It was dietary laws. There's all these different things that needed to take place, right? Here, he says, these are requirements that we're asking them to do. And what he is really saying is, look, it's really apart from the law. What we're asking you to do is what Ephesians 2.10 says. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. When we come to Christ and he completely transforms us, he says, hey, it doesn't end there. By faith, this thing that I'm going to cultivate in you, you're going to cry out to me and I'll give you the strength to do and not do certain things that need to happen in your life. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. What he's talking about here is there's obviously a problem with the Jewish believers. The Jewish believers, believers are saying, we're having a problem with the Gentiles. I don't want to hang with them. I don't want to be with them. I don't even think they're saved. 
So here's what he says. He said, listen, when you're around Jewish individuals, there's a certain way I want you to act and there's things I don't want you to do. And there's things that God writes on your heart that are supposed to be taking place in you as well too. He's going to do this work inside of you. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the work. It's an aftermarket product that he does in your heart and in your life. Paul put it this way. And let me see if I can't find the verse. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 20. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I also lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so that I could bring to Christ those who were under the law. Now, when I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I also live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ in my heart. And there's a couple of things here. And right there, Paul is saying this, look, I've become all things to all people that I might win some. And, and listen, you're going to run into people in Christianity, these are believers who are what is called the weaker brother. And they're going to have problems with certain things that you allow in your life, which are fine in Christ, but it's not fine with them. They're not there spiritually. And you're going to need to say, look, when I'm around them, I'm not going to do those things. So let's just let me, let me give you a, a f just in case. When you come over to my house, it is a new house. Just don't be bringing alcohol into my house. You know why? I'm not talking about you, Mike. I'm just kidding. You know why? Because it's a sin to drink. Is that what I'm saying? No, because I have a problem. Because 33 years ago, I had an issue with alcohol and weed. And if you come into my house, to this day, if I smell it, I'm going to be like, oh. It's been 33 years without getting drunk. 33 years. How many for you, Philip? Four years sober. Is that God doing it or Philip doing it? Glory to God. Do I want to come into somebody's house and be a stumbling block to them with the way that I live? A lot of these uh, Gentiles were involved in, in idol worship and they understood that they could get their meat cheap over here at this particular place or they could get their, you know, meat that is kosher, that's more expensive over in another place, all right? And here, basically what he's saying is, look, it would be a stumbling block for you to <laughs> sit down with Jewish individuals and eat your bacon and eat your meat that's been offered to idols and in front of them where they're like, man, I can't have no bacon. Can you imagine a life without bacon? I just want to let that sit there for a second. No bacon. Lately, almost every Saturday morning, I got a, three packets of bacon. I got to fry up. Why? Because it's so good. But around Jewish people, I'm making a choice. I'm not going to eat bacon. Are you aching? Yes. I'm not going to eat it for some bacon. I'm not going to do it. Why? Because it might cause them to stumble. It might cause them to have a problem and an issue. There's after, after salvation, there are things in your life, the law of Christ... And the royal law of love that you have to submit to, that you have to say, Jesus, do this work in me. I by faith trust you that your plan is better than mine and I'm going to trust in you. It's not the law. No, but it is saying, Jesus, I, I need your help. I need your work. I need to grow. And I want my friends to grow in Christ as well too. Therefore, James said, there's certain things that we want you to work on. Certain things and areas in your life that we want you to make sure that you're not becoming a stumbling block. So, these individuals are, are called and asked to go back to the, the church at Antioch and to share these things. So, Paul and Barnabas go with them. And this information was for Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. It says in verse 24, it says this. Compose this letter. This is what you're going to say to the Gentile believers. We understand that some men uh, from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. So we decided, having come to a complete agreement, to send you official representation along with the beloved Barnabas and Paul. Verse 26, 
who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus. We are sending Judas also, Silas, this is a different Judas, to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good of the Holy Spirit and to us not to lay any greater burden on you than these few, oh there it is, requirements. You abstain from eating food offered to idols, out of preference to your brother, from consuming blood or meat that, that strangled. These are all parts of the idolatrous worship that they were, had been a part of and that would be detestable to the Jews and from sexual immorality. If you do these, you'll be doing well. The messengers went to Antioch. There they called for a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. Look at verse 31. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read the encouraging message that you do not have to add anything to Jesus. Add nothing to Jesus. It's not Jesus plus this. It's Jesus alone. And that's what we need to live by and understand. That's what he's trying to do in our hearts and our life. And you know it too. You know it when you start. The, you have indicators in your life and temptations in your life that show you that, hey, I'm being pulled away to find my satisfaction, to find my hope. Hey, kids, let me ask a question. How many of you guys are probably going to want some ice cream or some candy after you eat lunch today? Some of you. Any of you? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I got a big one in the front row saying, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You, probably your mom and dad might have, they might have a problem with that, right? They may. Okay. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Jesus isn't like this big downer that comes alongside and says, if it's good and it's fun, I don't want you to have it. I'm Jesus. That's me. No. He said, all he's saying is, listen, don't just make me a part of your life. Make me all in your life. And when you have things that you want or need, cry out to me. Ask me for it. Ask, here kids, here's what you got to do. Ask, ask the Lord to go before you. Before you ask mom and dad for whatever, V-Bucks, I don't care, whatever it is. Did you know V-Bucks aren't bad? Did you guys know that? They sure seem bad when I go and ask you, Dad, on Friday. Yes, they seem bad. They just feel bad, you know, like you're throwing money away completely, right? But listen, if it's something that you, one of the things that we try to teach in our home is, in all your ways, know him, acknowledge him. In all your ways, allow him to be a part. Here's what I want you to do. It's pray, Lord, go before me. Go before me. Before I ask mom and dad this thing, Make that way smooth to mom and dad. Help their hearts to want to say yes. But Jesus, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. If you say no, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe that you have better. And if mom and dad say no, I'm going to have a right attitude. Kids, let me, let me just tell you something. When you ask mom and dad for something, they want to give it to you. When they have to say no, and you walk away like this, okay, thanks mom and dad. You know what they're thinking in their heart? Man, that kind of attitude? I just want to go dish up a bowl of ice cream for them right now. But if you stand there, like some people, like, why can't I eat some ice cream? <laughs> you know what you're doing? You're choosing to live apart from Jesus. Because it's a stumbling block to mom and dad when you're like, no, children, obey your parents and the Lord. This is right. There's a reason and a purpose. Have an attitude that says, Jesus, you know what? You're Lord of my life. And I'm going to trust you. He's going to make that path for you. He's going to make that way. Mom and dad have a problem with it too. We all have a problem and an issue of trying to live a life apart from Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus is good. Jesus is, he's okay. But when you start saying that, there's the issue. There's the problem. In all your ways, know him. Let's all stand together this morning. Hey guys, can I ask you a favor? This is me. So, how many of you are on social media? All right. <laughs>
How many of you want your church to grow and you're on social media? All right. If, if that's true, if it's the Holy Spirit for me, obey him. But if it's not and it's just Pastor Dave, don't listen to Pastor Dave. I'm going to tell you this over and over again. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't listen to Pastor Dave. But if Holy Spirit and Pastor Dave come along and line up, then okay, do it. Would you um, share this meeting? What Mel's going to try to get it out by probably Friday, possibly. Would you share this with your friends and family? I, I'm just saying. Maybe the Holy Spirit will direct you in that way. To say, you know what? Oh, this is your church service? Oh, okay. Maybe I can listen to that. Maybe I need that. Do you know friends and family who need to hear the message that you just heard this morning? From the praise team and from the Holy Spirit. Well, if you do and you care about your church, maybe this is what God is doing. If this is me talking this morning, do not do it. Do not do it. How many of you have been a part of a church that had bylaws? And every time you asked them for something, they always went to the bylaws. Well, the bylaws say to do this, 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 and this. And if this happens, then you do this, 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 and this. You know what that's called? That's called living without Jesus. Because I trust Jesus to work in your heart and in your life. And if he's telling you to do it, listen to what he has to say. Don't listen to what man has written. Listen to him. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you, Lord, that we can trust you to govern our life and to direct our life. And Lord, we testify this morning that you are enough. That you're more than enough and that you are good. Father, we praise you that we can hear from you. We can get along with our brother. And Lord, that your grace is sufficient for us. For your strength is made perfect in weakness. Father, thank you that you, he who began a good work in us, will be faithful to complete it. Thank you, Lord, that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And we can trust in you. Father, you know that it is very difficult for us to live in faith trusting you. But we testify this morning that you are Lord. And we want you to sit on the throne of our hearts and our life. Father, we praise you for what you're going to do in your midst. We thank you for this morning. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.